Hey everybody, it's Lon Seibin, and we're taking a look today at another wireless mesh system that is from Linksys. This is called the Velop, and we'll be taking a look at this and maybe uh, comparing it to the Google Wi-Fi we looked at not that long ago. I do want to mention, in the interest of full disclosure, this came in free of charge through the Amazon Vine program. However, all the opinions you're about to hear are my own. Nobody is paying for this review, and no one is reviewing this content before it is posted. All right, so let's take a closer look now at the hardware. And just like other wireless mesh systems on the market, this is going to set you back quite a bit. The two-pack that Amazon sent to me for the review uh, cost $349. And you basically get two identical devices in that box. And uh, one of them becomes the router, the first one that gets plugged in. And the subsequent devices become the remote nodes. And you can also get a three-pack if you want to pay more uh, for $485. Now, by comparison, the Google Wi-Fi system gives you three units in the box box for $299. And the reason why I think this one costs a little more is that it does have a more robust wireless radio. So this has a 3x3 three three wireless radio uh, versus a 2x2 two two on the Google Wi-Fi. I'll put a link down below to a video that I did explaining what that means. But basically, there are more channels available on uh, these devices. And that means, at least in my testing, that you will see faster speeds from the remote nodes when they're connected wirelessly back to the main node. So I was seeing almost double the speed I was seeing on the Google Wi-Fi uh, because there is just more uh, radio to work with on these things. So that is probably why they cost a little bit more. Whether or not you need that is going to be up to you. Now, on the bottom here, you've got a couple of ports, only two actually, uh, two Ethernet jacks here. And one of them on the main unit will go into your cable modem or DSL modem to bring the internet in. Uh, the other jack here you can use to plug in a game console or a computer or something like that. On the remote nodes, both of these ports will be available because this device will be communicating back to the mothership wirelessly. So you can plug in. Uh, two different things on there. Now, if you have more things to connect via Ethernet, you can always get a very inexpensive Ethernet switch. I'll put a link to one down below in the video description, probably about $30 or so. You plug that switch into one of those ports, and then you'll get a bunch more Ethernet ports available to you. So these things tend to not have many Ethernet ports, and uh, this one is no exception. Uh, there is a reset button here for getting it back to its uh, native state. Your power goes in there, and there's a power switch. And speaking of power, I noticed that the, uh, the, the power adapter for this thing is just oddly wide, in fact, wider than it should be. So it doesn't give you a, a little separate brick, but they've built it all into the unit that goes into the wall. And I think it's just a little too wide for uh, some outlets, at least maybe things that you might have next to it. At least for me, I have a light switch where I was testing it and I couldn't get the, uh, the dimmer switch to work because the uh, wide uh, nature of the power plug took up a lot of room there. Now, I ran a number of speed tests using the open source iPerf software to see how fast we could transit data over the wireless network. Now, my methodology is I take a laptop, connect it via Ethernet to the main node, and then I take another laptop out and try to connect back to it uh, with a wireless connection. And I used a, a brand new MacBook Pro that has the latest wireless technology on it to conduct the test so we can get a good feel as to how everything would work under ideal circumstances. And the first test I ran was a very ideal circumstance test where I had the uh, wireless uh, hub over here and our uh, computer right here, and I was getting speeds of about 400 to 500 megabits per second wirelessly. So the speed here is at least about the same as I saw on the Google Wi Wi-Fi when connected to the main node. Uh, when I went out to the remote uh, mesh node, though, it actually did better than the Google Wi-Fi. I was getting anywhere from 200 to 300 megabits uh, when I was connecting to that wireless remote node and sending that data back wirelessly to the main unit. And I think that's where uh, having the more robust uh, wireless radio on this product makes a difference. It was really a lot faster than when I tested with the Google Wi-Fi with that same equipment uh, in the same spots in the house here. So good performance on the uh, backhaul from the wireless side of things. And I think if you are setting these things up ideally where you have one kind of overlapping the other, uh, you'll get really decent wireless performance. I didn't see all that much of a drop off in latency either. We're getting about anywhere from four to nine milliseconds in latency uh, connecting from the remote wireless node back to the main unit here. So it's actually doing pretty well. Uh, and I was very impressed with uh, how well it did work. And the last thing I tested was I took uh, the remote node and connected it via Ethernet back to the main unit because these units support a wired backhauling. In other words, instead of using the wireless to come back to the main unit, I can actually connect it up to a, a network jack and have it send its data back via an Ethernet cable. And if you have Ethernet uh, throughout your home, it's a great way to get better performance. And when I did that, I was getting about 500 megabits per second on the remote node because it didn't have the bottleneck of the wireless network hopping back and forth between these nodes back 
back to the main one. So if you can hook up via a wired network, uh, that is the way to go. If you don't have computer network jacks in your home, but you do have a bunch of cable outlets, uh, there's a technology called Mocha that I've done a lot of videos about. I'll put a link down to some of those videos in the description uh, where you can actually turn your cable television wiring into Ethernet, essentially, and get really good speeds uh, back to your mothership in the house. So all in, very good performance. But let's take a look now and see how the software side of this works using their mobile app. Now the software, at least at the time that I'm recording this video, does need some work because I am connected right now uh, to the Velop system with this phone wirelessly as well as a computer that is here next to me. I think one upstairs might be connected to it as well. None of them are showing up here on the list of devices and I'm seeing that this uh, device list is very slow to update and sometimes uh, if you go out of the app uh, and then try to reopen it basically from scratch here, which I'm going to do, uh, it might give you a better connection here. So let's see if this will uh, work better now or at least give us an update here as to whether or not things are working. Working. Uh, this screen here where it says getting router settings, you will see quite often, even if you hop out of the app for a minute or two and go back in, it sometimes takes a while for this thing to update. Uh, but now that we've come back into it, it is now giving us the correct number of devices. So I have my iPhone and my MacBook Air here, both connected via a five gigahertz connection. The problem though, is that it doesn't tell you uh, which uh, node you're connected to on the network. So if you're trying to troubleshoot why somebody's connection is so bad, uh, you're not really going to know which one they're connecting to. And that's a bit of an issue for me. I'd like to be able to see exactly which node I'm into so that I can figure out if it's the computer or the node or something else uh, on the network network causing issues. So that was a, a problem that I saw there. Uh, back to the dashboard here, you can get a feel for your internet connection. Uh, you can then go in and uh, turn on the guest access. There's also parental controls that you can set on a, a per device basis. So for example, if I'm trying to prevent a phone or a computer from connecting to facebook.com, I could go over here to the uh, device section, select a device that I wish to not get onto Facebook, go over to parental controls, and then uh, block a specific site in here, provided that uh, the app they're using to connect to it actually goes to Facebook.com. Sometimes these apps uh, connect to some other address and then you'll have to try to figure out uh, what it's connecting to. But now that site is blocked and if they try to use it, uh, they can't get on there. Uh, likewise, I can also just turn the computer off the internet completely just by clicking on the block button here and they are uh, completely knocked out. Now, this doesn't have any scheduling or any grouping or that kind of thing. So you have to set up the blocking on a per device basis. So you can't just say, here's all the kids devices and then uh, knock them all off at the same time. So there's just a couple things lacking on here that I've seen on uh, other uh, routers and Wi-Fi systems lately that are not really on here. Uh, device prioritization might be something useful if you have a game console or a gaming PC on the network that you want to make sure always gets the best possible connection. Uh, you can select up to three devices on your network to always take priority over everything else. So that might be helpful if you uh, have someone uploading a lot of stuff and you want to still have your game work. Uh, you can have your gaming PC kind of be the uh, primary device for that. Uh, there isn't much else on here though. It really is a pretty Spartan interface, actually very similar to uh, many other uh, devices like this one. So for example, if I go over here to advanced settings, uh, there's just a couple of things like port forwarding, this basic port forwarding that you might see on uh, other routers. Uh, you do have the ability to uh, set up some Wi-Fi Mac filters if you want to uh, prevent certain connections from happening on your network, for example. And you have some very basic internet settings here as well. There really isn't much that uh, you can do with this uh, routing device, again, because this is more of a consumer uh, driven thing. My biggest gripe comes in the administration of the node. So the setup process, like I said, is very easy. You get everything hooked up. It finds everything on the network and just kind of works. Uh, but the problem is, is that you don't get an ongoing connection status from the remote node. So right now I've got one of these things set up in my kitchen. Uh, the office one is the one that's on the desk next to me, but I have no idea as to its signal strength right now. I got a, a little notice that said it was good when I first hooked it up, but I don't have any way of knowing on an ongoing basis how good that connection is back to the main unit. And I might want to adjust things over time or maybe move it around uh, to a better part of the room. And the only way to really get another connection test out of it is to actually reconnect it from scratch. And that seemed to me uh, not the best way to do it. Probably a fixable problem. Again, this is all software stuff, so that might be a better way to go about it. But right now, I'm not crazy about uh, how those nodes uh, report their status back to the main unit here. I think there's better ways to do that. Uh, you also do have a guest network available as well. In fact, you can turn it on and off with Alexa with your voice if you want to do something like that. Uh, so there are some neat little features here that uh, come into play. But overall, I think the software here is a bit lacking, and I would like to see a little bit more robustness in its parental controls as well as some of the uh, maintenance kinds of 
of things when you're uh, looking at uh, different devices on the network. Now, one other area that needs some attention on this device is how it picks the Wi-Fi channels it operates on. So Wi-Fi, like everything else that comes over the air, like TV stations and radio stations, uh, has different channels available for devices to operate on. And uh, what they're supposed to do is find the one that is the least saturated with other stuff so it doesn't have as much interference, which means you get a better performance. And I actually leave Wi-Fi channels available here at the house for uh, things like this that I'm testing. And for whatever reason, uh, this device, when I plugged it in, insisted on attaching to the channel that everything else here in the house is operating on. And as a result, I wasn't getting great performance out of it initially because it was interfering with my other equipment. And I ran its channel search function. It still kept putting itself on that channel until I unplugged it and plugged it back in a few times. And finally, it got itself onto something that was less saturated. And I say this because if you are in a, a dense environment where you have a lot of other homes around you, uh, those other homes likely have Wi-Fi devices operating, and those will present some interference. And these things really need to be smarter about uh, which channels they choose to operate on. And this one didn't demonstrate to me that it was doing that. I think it's fixable via firmware, uh, but it is something I would like to see fixed on it because uh, it really does perform well when it does find a nice clear channel to operate on. In fact, it's the fastest device I have seen from uh, the remote node perspective. In other words, the speed that I got when I was connected to a remote node uh, wirelessly and then having that wireless node connect wirelessly to this one uh, really was the fastest connection I've seen so far in some of the stuff that I have tested. So really good performance out of it, but again, it wasn't so smart about uh, finding the right channels. So the big question here is whether or not the higher price tag of the Linksys makes sense uh, compared to the Google Wi-Fi. And I think in most cases, the answer would be no, because for Google system, you get three nodes for 300 bucks. Uh, this one came in two nodes at $350. Now these are faster in between each other, uh, but I don't think most consumers will benefit from that speed. And I think picking up an extra node uh, for less money will actually improve things more than you might realize, because I think a lot of folks are having Wi-Fi problems, not because of the speed of their Wi-Fi, but the quality of the connection. So the more connection points you can set up throughout your home, the better. And I just think this is a little overpriced, uh, given that its software isn't as good as the Google system, even though the speed in between nodes is a lot faster. So I think if you are a enthusiast or someone who's got a lot of data to copy back and forth between computers on your network, uh, this is going to do better, of course, because your file transfers will be faster. But I think for what most consumers do on the internet, uh, this won't offer anything more for its high price than the Google system does. So just something to think about as you are out there shopping. But there is room for improvement on this, especially on the software side. I think the hardware is very sound. So I'm actually eager to come back to this maybe in a few months after some software updates have taken place to see uh, what kind of improvements they've made, because I really like the performance of the hardware. The software is kind of lacking for me. And again, it doesn't make a, a justification for its uh, significantly higher price tag over the Google Wi-Fi. This is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by my Patreon supporters. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash Patreon to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.